Welcome to week 10 of Technical Writing, English 2575 with me, Professor Ellis. I uh, want to thank you all for hanging in there. I know this has been um, a rough semester, but um, imagining we're well past halfway uh, means that uh, it's all downhill from here. We can all make it through this. Um, so in today's class, I just wanted to have uh, a little bit of time at the beginning for some housekeeping stuff. And then we'll talk about um, the instruction manuals, next step, which will be peer review, uh, and what we have coming up in terms of uh, submitting the instructional manual uh, beginning next week. And I'll explain what I mean by beginning. And then also us uh, starting the collaborative project in the class, which is like the big group-based, team-based project uh, that you'll be working on. Uh, to conclude the semester. So first off, I uh, want to remind everyone uh, to make sure that if you are eligible and you've registered that you go out and vote and encourage your friends and family to go out and vote too. Um, it's important to remember that our democracy is dependent upon participation. So regardless of whatever your uh, political beliefs are, you need to be out there voting. Um, and to get other people to go out and vote as well. Uh, There's only one of many ways that we can participate, but it's like a super important one. Uh, I voted uh, yesterday uh, during early voting over at Red Hook. Uh, and if you look on the official um, Board of Elections website, vote.nyc, uh, it has all the information about voting locations, um, uh, registering, all that kind of stuff. So make sure that uh, you check that out if you haven't already voted or if you weren't sure that you were going to vote. That maybe you're on the fence. But you know, from me to you, please go out and vote. Um, now getting back to class stuff uh, or things relating to our class, I'm going to post a link to our Open Lab site uh, for Plan Week. Uh, I just received an email about this. And this is going to be coming up beginning today through the next few days um, to help everyone get advisement uh, for you know, their majors and for graduation stuff. Um, so I'll post this to our Open Lab site uh, so you can check it out. You should have already received emails about it, but just as a reminder, this is something everybody needs to do to make sure you're on track for graduation. Um, or if you need help, like choosing your classes and whatnot. Um, if anybody has like just general questions about um, what classes to take or advice about choosing classes, any of that kind of stuff, I can help you with that informally, not as an official advisor, uh, but that's something we can use office hours to talk about. Um, so please, you also rely on me as um, uh, another source of information regarding like your know, classes. Uh, that you might want to take. And let's see, so we got plan week. That's done. Uh, I'm working on the expanded definition grading now. Uh, so once that's done, um, you'll be able to scroll down our open lab site and under course grade book, I'll have those grades posted here with feedback um, on, on your assignment. Uh, let's see. My students. Ah, also wanted to give another shout out to the job search advice um, website that I built on Open Lab for everyone. Um, right now is the time if you're thinking about like even getting seasonal work coming up, you need to brush off your resume, clean it up, and get it ready to to start sending out to places that may be doing temporary hiring uh, for the holidays or even like your know, long term hiring. Uh, in your field if you're about to graduate. Uh, so make sure that you take a look at this. I'll, I'll re-up this on our Open Lab site. Um, so it'll be like at the top of uh, the list of posts that I've made because uh, I got a lot of good information on here that might be beneficial to you guys, uh, including this lecture about the job application process, sample documents about like what a good resume looks like in more than one format, you know, one involving the skills-based resume and one that you're probably more familiar with, the experience-based resume. 
Also give you a sample job application letter or what uh, some people call a cover letter. And then there's boatloads of links here that I found that have really good information for doing research on jobs, uh, how to make the best resumes, best cover letters, how to prepare for interviews, uh, and other general job hunting advice as well as additional writing resources because all of these documents that you make need to you know, use good diction or word choice, need to have good grammar, and want to make sure that like you don't have any like awkward sentences, and you also want to make sure that you you know, everything is copy edited and pristine and as perfect as you can make it because you don't want to give anyone an opportunity to disqualify you simply because you misspelled a word or you put a, you know, a, 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 a character of punctuation in the wrong place. So I'll give you a link again to that on our Open Lab site. Uh, so please check that out because I do want the best for all of you um, as you're you know, moving forward and about to graduate. Another piece of advice uh, relating to this, you know, I've been writing recommendation letters for folks uh, this semester and I'm certainly happy to do that for folks that have gone through my classes. Um, but for many uh, of you who are not going into writing careers, you really need to, to touch base and reach out to some of your professors in your field of study and ask them if they can write you letters of recommendation, particularly folks you might have done an independent study with or that you've done you know, a significant project in their class that they can you say something about. That way it's more persuasive to the person that's doing the hiring that A, this person knows who you are, B, that they can talk intelligently about your work, uh, your knowledge, how qualified you are for the job. Um, whereas like I can certainly talk about like you, you being a communicator, the types of work you've done in my class, but it really, really sings when you get someone that knows your career-focused work intimately and can write about it in a very positive way. And uh, a last piece of advice with that, uh, I recommend that when you do reach out to someone to write you a recommendation letter, you know, make sure you remind them like your, what class you took and when you took it, like what semester and year. Um, and also ask them if they can write you a strong letter of recommendation. Um, it's rare, but I have I know of friends personally, and I've heard of cases where uh, people, you know, for a variety of reasons, not just professors, but also like former managers where you might have worked somewhere before, for whatever reason, don't write the best letters. Um, I don't know if it's because the person didn't ask point blank if it can be a strong letter of recommendation or if it was something else going on, but if someone you know, is honest, uh, they'll either say yes they can or no they can't. If they say no, then you probably want to look elsewhere for a letter writer or a recommender uh, to make sure that they are able to put you in the best possible light for the job that you're applying for. Uh, and it's also helpful to send information to who you're asking to write a letter or recommendation about you know, what job you're applying for, or jobs you're applying for, maybe some links to the job listing on you know, monster.com or wherever you found the job listing at. Um, because any information you give your letter writer, it helps them write you a better letter because then they can learn about what you're actually applying for and try to, to figure out linkages between what they know about you and your work with um, you know, the type of job you're applying for. So help them help you, basically. All right, so that's job stuff. And we talked about grading. And the last thing I wanted to mention, um, for everybody that has a New York Public Library card, and for those of you who don't, I want you to go out and get a New York Public Library card. Not, I mean, obviously, you can check out books with it, and you can use resources at the different branch uh, New York Public Library locations. It's free. Uh, you can check out books for free. You can check out movies for free. Uh, all sorts of stuff. But what's really cool for all of you that I want you guys to know about is access to lynda.com. Now ordinarily lynda.com is a subscription-based 
educational service. Like they teach you how to do things. And it costs like a lot of money, relatively speaking. Like I can't afford to have a subscription to that. But because I have a New York Public Library card, I have access to lynda.com for free. So if you can see here, to, to find the listing to this, like if you already have a lynda.com, um, I mean a, a New York Public Library card, just do like a Google search. So I'm going to go to Google and type in lynda, L-Y-N-D-A, space, NYPL for New York Public Library. Very first link, lynda.com in their databases. And then you'll see this link here for connect to database. So I'm going to click that. I type in my library card number and, and library card pin number. And then I have access to lynda.com. Now just to kind of show you um, all the different things they can teach you how to do. All these things about 3D um, modeling, printing, animation. You can see different topics. You can see software. Also learning paths. Like if you want to become a 2D digital animator, a 3D character animator, they have all that over here on learning paths. Audio and music. If you want to learn about music production, how to edit music, mixing it, different software that you would use for that. All that's here. Um, business, if you want to learn like some background in business, how to be an entrepreneur, how to run your own business, how to use software that helps you with that, they go through all that stuff here. Computer-aided design, illustration visual design, how to do programming, different types of development tools, different programming languages. All of this stuff is available for free if you use your New York Public Library card um, to access lynda.com. Uh, more things about education learning. This is stuff that's useful for me uh, that I check out occasionally. Uh, IT, if you want to learn more things that, than what you already know from your classes or need a refresher, they have lessons on different IT topics. Uh, marketing, photography, if you're like a, a photo hobbyist, you can find out more to up your game uh, through the photography section. Same is true for videography. Uh, web development, they have lots of different um, uh, courses about that. But the cool thing about the courses, they're all led by professionals. They're all video based. Uh, but the, the neat thing about it is like you're not sitting there having to watch like, you know, a six hour long video. Everything is broken up into shorter videos and everything is captioned. And you can actually look at the transcript on the videos and search for key words and then watch just the section of the video that you may be interested in learning more about. Because um, the thing is, like, obviously you can go to like YouTube, for example, and look up and find where someone has talked about how to do something you need to know how to, to do in a piece of software. Here, though, you have people going much more in depth, going step by step uh, in a professional setting uh, to give you those lessons on a much higher, you know, production quality level than what you're going to find usually on YouTube. Um, so lynda.com, I mean, the thing that I've, I've talked about before and I'll stress again is that we have to be lifelong learners, uh, that you can't just rely on what you get in you know, a four-year degree program uh, to get you through the rest of your career, that you have to be continually learning and also not just learning in your field, but learning broadly, learning new topics, new things that might enrich what you do in your career or that might you know, present a way for you to pivot away from what you're doing in your career towards something else uh, that will you know, provide like a new career path. Um, because with how uncertain things are in terms of you know, the, the economy, uh, with the uncertainty in different jobs and industries, you need to protect yourself as best as possible. And you do that by equipping yourself with knowledge and also skill and demonstrated skill. Um, and lynda.com is one way to begin that process where you can learn things and then you want to demonstrate what you've learned, maybe by creating your own blog to show off some of the things that you've made you know, by following the lessons that they provide on lynda.com or on social media or on your linkedin.com profile. The idea is like to learn, to demonstrate, 
and then to you know, try to get some practical experience either by volunteering, uh, you know, picking up you know um, gig work or you know a part-time job, or even transitioning to an, a new full-time job, because uh, that all beefs up your resume and makes you more competitive in a very competitive job market. All right, so those are the main things that I wanted to go over during the first part of class. So let's turn our attention back to our Open Lab site and what we're currently working on, which is that instruction manual. Um, so I just wanted to give you some reminders about where to find things um, as you're continuing to draft your instruction manual. So for week nine, that's last week, uh, you can see here if I scroll down, uh, week nine, do, 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 under the weekly writing assignment for week nine. I gave you instructions how to begin building your instruction manual using um, Google Docs and Google's Drive technology, which Docs is a part of now. And at the bottom of this, I gave you this outline. And this is a basic outline that you can copy and paste into your instructional manual Google Doc uh, that has all the main parts that you want to have in your instruction manual. And so it becomes basically you copy and paste this into your Google Doc, and then you begin plugging and chugging. Plug and chug is the idea where you have the outline, and then you think, okay, what goes here? What goes in this next part? And then you begin typing that up in your own words. Now, as a part of that, you keep in mind that all the writing and all the images that you use in your instruction manual need to be made by you. Now, certainly you can get ideas from your instruction manuals that you found in your research. Um, you can also take screenshots of things that you find, like on apps, or that you, um, if you're trying to illustrate something from a website that's a part of your instructions, you can take screenshots of that. But otherwise, all the writing and images need to be by you. Now, however, I do encourage you to research and quote and cite sources that you find through the library or online with one caveat. When I'm talking about research, I'm talking about researching um, words that may be like your sentences, paragraphs, passages that can reinforce the things that you're writing about in your instruction manual. So like if you drop a piece of jargon into your instruction manual, if you think that your audience for that instruction manual needs to know what that word means, what that piece of jargon means, why not go into one of the encyclopedias or dictionaries that we have access to through the library's website that we know about from the Expanded Definition Project. You see how these things are relating, right? So you can go back to some of those databases look up that piece of jargon and cite the definition in your instruction manual. Okay, now you can quote it and then you need to give a parenthetical citation at the end of it and then you also need to include it in your reference list right here, reference list at the very end of your document. Now you can also, and this is the caveat, you know, the, the warning I want to give you though, is that in addition to the library, I'm also okay with you going out to different web-based sources. Uh, that does not include Wikipedia, because as I've mentioned before, Wikipedia is a dynamic living document, and to try to quote and cite from it, you may quote something that doesn't exist later on. So it needs to be from some static type of website, like it could be a news website, uh, it could be like a, a corporate website about maybe a product that you're going to be writing your instruction manual on. Uh, those will be more in line with something that you can quote and cite from. But you need to ask yourself you know, some questions. You know, is this you know, a source that's going to be semi-permanent? I mean, obviously nothing, nothing is necessarily permanent online, but is it semi-permanent? Whereas like Wikipedia changes from moment to moment, potentially, other sources that are more like a static web page might not. Ask yourself, where does this come from? You know, who wrote it? Um, you know, what is their qualifications? And is it worthy of being trusted? Is it from a trustworthy source? 
Like obviously if it's from like the company that made something that you're writing about, well, they're going to be, you know, obviously they're in the business of selling this thing, but they're probably going to know a lot about the product. And so you can rely on it in that sense. Uh, but if you were wanting to put in like warnings that maybe the company doesn't cover, um, then you probably want to look for other places because if the company doesn't mention those things, it doesn't necessarily mean that the warning shouldn't exist but based on your own research, your own experience, etc. All right, so you have the outline here. And then if you scroll down a little bit further for week nine, uh, in last week's lecture, I went over uh, this is sample instructional, instructional manual that I made. Um, and also this one that showed off just like how to include some drawings that you can make yourself in Google Docs. So look back at that lecture for all of that. But I'll open the sample instruction manual. Let's just take a look at it again real quick. I'm going to zoom out so we can see more like a page view of this. So when you get your instruction manual to you know a more solid draft, yours need to look like this sample that I made, where you begin with a cover page with a title, and I give you your name, your major, uh, the, our school name, New York City College of Technology, comma, CUNY, um, a point of contact statement here at the bottom. So, I mean, make yours look like this. Table of contents. And this is basically, you know, your outline copied again. And what you might find, when you're, you know, once you begin writing your instruction manual, you may need to add some things to that outline that I gave you. That outline is just like a basic outline, but you might find you need to input more sections on that, which that's totally fine. I want you to do that if you need to, but just keep in mind if your outline for your instruction manual changes, you need to change it on your table of contents to make sure that what's on the table of contents mirrors what is in the instruction manual body, where all the content, all the writing is, okay? So we got the table of contents. Then we have the introduction where you begin talking about like what is this instruction manual about? What is its purpose? Who is its audience? Who do you intend to read this thing? What is its scope? The scope again is like what is you know, it's explicitly covering and what is it leaving out? Because you know, you if you're talking about, um, let's say, cr making a printed circuit board, uh, you may only be talking about like the initial design of it. You may not be talking about actually dipping it in acid and all the rest of it. So set out what your scope is so that your reader knows what to like. You know, what is it actually going to be covering? And you might find that in these different sections, there's repetition. Okay, that's okay. All that counts toward your total word count, if you're thinking about it in those practical terms. But why it's important for an instructional manual writer is that repetition helps your reader because your reader may not read your instructional manual from the beginning to the last page. They may just jump in at different points and only read different excerpts. And so by repeating some information or rephrasing information, which is probably better, not necessarily just copy and paste, but rephrasing it for the specificity, the specifics of the section you're writing in, actually helps the reader so that they'll catch important information that otherwise they may miss out on. Uh, again, uh, organizational description, uh, like how you lay out the instructional manual. Again, this is kind of like writing up the different sections that are on your table of contents, basically, um, but in a paragraph sentence form. Conventions. This is where you list out any abbreviations or acronyms and what they mean that you plan to use later on in your instruction manual. Uh, and you may not you know, find those until you write your instructions, okay? So as you write your instructions, if you find you want to use an abbreviation or an acronym, as you use it in the instruction manual, go back up to the convention section and add it in. Easy enough. 
Uh, motivation. What's the so what? What motivated you to write up this kind of instruction manual? And don't say that it's because, like I told you to, because I'm not telling you what to write about. That's up to you. So what is like your motivation behind what you've selected for this project? Uh, and then safety and disclaimers. These are the safety warnings that may or may not be applicable, but you may want to note whether there are some or not in this section. Description of the equipment. Again, this is where you talk about like what uh, pieces of equipment you're going to be making the instruction manual about. It could simply be an app. Um, it could be about smartphone. Uh, it could be about like a specific type of smartphone, Android versus iOS. But you'll want to describe those things and maybe take a photo or draw a picture to illustrate what you're talking about. Uh, list of materials and equipment need. This is not just the, the main thing you're talking about, but anything else you might need. So if the main thing your instruction manual about is an app and you just include like a screenshot of the app and its icon on um, the description of the equipment, then in the list of materials and equipment needed, you would also want to include like what smartphone you need or type of smartphone you need for the app. And so you would have two things, the app and smartphone. Um, this is a table of parts with a description of each. So this is where, besides just showing, you tell your audience what it is that they need for the equipment for the instructions. Then the main part is your directions. And this is step by step. Begin here, do this. Step two, do that. Step three, do this other thing. And you want to be direct. Don't use passive language. You want to say, do this, do that press this, push that, move this other thing. Use direct active verbs uh, in your directions. Include pictures, screenshots, images. Again, they need to be made by you. Don't just copy something from Google Images. Um, that will, I mean, just from, you know, pragmatically, that will count against you on the instruction manual because part of the parameters that I've set is that everything has to be by you except for quoting words that you might find in your research, okay? Images have to be something that you make yourself. And then after we get through the directions, and you might have, you know, it's okay to have multiple processes. Like if you have, uh, say, if you went the route of a um, standard operating procedures guide, something that's internal versus external. Like these directions are like externally focused toward like a consumer, right? But if, as I talked about in the last lecture, internal documentation for inside of a workplace or inside of a team, uh, you might have multiple processes of smaller tasks to be done. Um, and so again, you can have as many as you want. That you can that you have time obviously to write, um, but don't overburden yourself. You be realistic with what you can do, and I guarantee you, the words will come quickly. Um, it only has to be, uh, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 words, and the words will come quickly on this project. I guarantee you. Uh, after the directions, have a section on troubleshooting. This is where you offer like potential problems and their solutions. Have a section with a glossary, and this is one great place where you can define some words that you look up, jargon that you do research on. Again, cite it. Make sure you give things in quotes and give a parenthetical citation, and then down in your references list, a full bibliographic entry in APA format. Again, remember to use the Purdue OWL website to help you with that. And then there's the reference list. And notice I don't use any page numbers in my instruction manual. I'm using the section numbering method for all of my sections. Okay. And um, I'll go ahead and mention this now, uh, but I'll talk about it again next week when I talk about finalizing your instructions and then turning them in. Again, that's going to be next week when I show you all how to do that. Um, but the way that I've divided up each of these sections, as you see, section six 
begins at the top of a fresh page where section five is all this empty space down here, right? I did not put my cursor at the end of this paragraph and pressed enter on the keyboard a dozen times to get down to this page to begin section six. Do not do that, okay? That will inevitably screw up your document when you make changes, but also it demonstrates you don't know how to use the writing technologies that you use for creating the document. There is certain affordances and constraints, things you can do, things you can't do with a given piece of technology. The same is true for a word pro processor. That software is a type of technology with affordances and constraints that you can use to make the, the types of documents that you're going to make with this tool. So for this, what you do is after you complete like some writing at the end of one section, you just want to press return to go to the next line, and then you click on the insert menu. See insert? And then you want to go down to break, and then you enter a page break. A page break basically skips all that space and then goes down to the next page for you to begin writing again. Now why this is really cool is that as you're editing your document before you give me your final draft, if like let's say you add a paragraph here, it will not adjust any of the pagination before the next section. This next section will always be at the top of the next page. Whereas if you pressed enter a bunch of times, when you make any changes above this section, it'll keep moving all those enters down and screw up the pagination for your next section. Okay, so remember insert, break, page break between each section. So you can see from section five to six, there's a page break. From the end of section four to section five, that's a page break. I put a page break between each section and the same is true between the title page and the table of contents, between the table of contents and section one, all of those are page breaks. Uh, so page breaks are your friend. And I'll remind you of that next week when I show you how to turn in your, your document on our open lab site using Google Docs. Um, but one thing I will go ahead and show you that's related to that is what you're going to be doing for this week's weekly writing assignment. So for this week's weekly writing assignment, what I want you to do is circulate whatever you can get done. Okay, it doesn't have to be the finished product, um, but whatever you can get done on the instruction manual. Okay, and I want you to go ahead and do peer review with your teams. And again, it's only what you can get done. If all you got is the outline and your basic steps for the directions, that's fine. Because I want you to at least get some feedback so you can w begin finalizing your instructions as quickly as possible while we begin moving forward next week uh, to the team-based project. And I don't want anybody freaking out about any of this, okay? The idea is, this week we're going to do some peer review on your instruction manual project, okay? Just so you get more experience doing peer review, working with your team, uh, over whatever you can get done on the instruction manual. Once you've received that feedback, you're going to begin revising and finalizing your instruction manual. Next week, that'll be week 11, I will have you know, the first part of the lecture about how to turn in your instruction manual. But I don't expect you to necessarily turn in your instruction manual next week. It would be great if you can, because then I can go ahead and grade it and you'll know where your standing is on it. But you can continue working on it as we begin the team-based collaborative project, which I'll spend the second part of next week's lecture talking about. So basically, we're going to have 
you know, multiple projects going on at the same time. You're going to have your individual instruction assignment that you're going to be working on and getting ready to submit while we begin the collaborative project. Because I want you to begin talking with your team to, to you know, figure out what you're going to do the project on and begin moving forward on that as quickly as we can. Um, but if you need that extra time, like if you need, like let's say, another week to finish the instruction manual, I want you to take it because I want you to show me your best work on it. That's totally okay, considering everything that we're you know, going through right now. Um, the only thing that I ask is like, you know, when you do submit something, if you turn it in late, doesn't matter if it's this or something else in the class, just shoot me an email to jellis at cdtech.cuny.edu and just you know, give me a heads up. Hey, Professor Ellis, I just turned in such and such. So I know to go back and check it if I've already graded everybody else's work. Because um, basically the way this is all going to play out in our class is we have up until the end of the semester um, to get everything done and for me to grade everything and get grades in. So if you need a little bit extra time to finish something, you know, take it and then let me know when you've turned it in. If there is though, Okay, if there is like any like big problem that's going to really delay your ability to complete an assignment and you know about it, make sure you reach out to me. Some folks have and I appreciate that. That's good so that we're always in communication and we can work together to keep you on track. What I don't want to see is like someone who hasn't turned in anything all semester email me like, you know, right before grades are due and say, Professor Ellis, can I turn in stuff late? Well, at that point, it's realistically, you're probably not going to be able to turn anything in that's going to get you a passing grade unless you've been working on it already. So if something big is coming up that is derailing your progress or your success in our class, make sure you reach out to me. I, I want to work with everybody to keep everybody on track, okay? Um, but if it's like you know, just a little extra time that you need, it's not a big deal. Just take it and then email me afterwards, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm willing to work with everybody um, on this so that you get you know, the grade you deserve in the class. And sometimes that means you might need a little bit extra time. Um, all right, so that brings us to this week's weekly writing assignment, which is gonna be um, about you know, turning, about doing peer review on your, your instruction manual. So here I am in Google Docs. I got my instruction manual that I want to send around for peer review. And so what you want to do is click on File. And then we're going to click on Share. And now normar normar normally, uh, you can type in your know, people's your know, Gmail uh, account usernames or email addresses here to share your work with groups that you may want to collaborate with. But because we're doing peer review by email, basically we only need to allow your team members to read what you've written and then write their responses in an email to you about what needs to be corrected or what ideas they might ha have about making it better. And so for this project, uh, what we need to do is I'm going to click change. And let's see. Because see, I've already actually created a link for this. So let me um, do this. I'm going to go back to Google Drive. I'm going to make a new Google Doc. This is my instruction manual, right? Click on File and Share, or you can click on this nice big blue Share button in the upper right hand corner. Either one works. Same thing. Um, if you haven't named your document yet, it's going to ask you to name it. I'm going to save that. And then at the bottom here for Git Link, there's this text here, change to anyone with the link. 
And what that does is allow anybody that has this link to read what you've written in your instruction manual. They can't edit it, but they're going to be able to read by default what you've done. So after you've clicked that, click on copy link over here on the right. Okay. And it's going to say link copy. Great. I'm going to click done. And then you're going to go over to your email. And on Wednesday afternoon, I'm going to send a new peer review uh, email uh, to your team for peer review on the instruction manual. And do the same routine that you've done for the uh, article summary project and for the expanded definition project. Start your reply all. Okay, remember to reply all. And you say, hey everybody, you, um, I'm, you're needing some feedback on my instruction manual project. If you would read this and, and reply with some feedback, I would appreciate it. And of course, I will give you feedback on yours when you send around your link. And then hit, you hit enter a few times, paste your link to the document. Maybe before that, you can say, here's a link to my instruction manual. And then best, give your name, and then send. And for everybody that receives the email, they just click the link, and they'll be able to read what you've, you've published in your Google Doc of your instruction manual. And then they will reply all to the email and write in, Dear so-and-so, I've, I've read over your instruction manual. Here's my feedback. And give a couple of points to help them out. Your things you think that are, are needing development, things that you think work great, things that didn't work so great. But give people constructive ideas about how to fix it and make it better. Okay? Because there's this is not a zero-sum game. You want to help members of your team because if everybody does really great, everybody gets the good grade. You know, I'm not like grading on a curve where like you're helping out someone's going to take something away from you. It doesn't work like that. Everybody has the potential to do great in my class. So help each other out because the help you give them will be given back to you in return. Okay. So that, that's going to be this week's weekly writing assignment. I'm going to watch for those emails because I'll be CC'd on all of them. So make sure you always re click reply all so that I can see the emails you send and those that you receive back, okay? And that's how I check off if you're going to be getting credit for that. Now, just to keep in mind, uh, for next week, just to go over to our syllabus, so I'm back on our Open Lab site, clicking on Syllabus. So, do, 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 do. You can see we got coming up the collaborative assignment. This is all these collaborative guys here under um, the grading distribution are basically one interconnected project. Okay, they're all connected together. And the grade that I give on that, just to give everybody a heads up, I know I talked about this first class, but I'll say it again, is, is based on your team's effort. Okay, I don't give individual grades on that. So you'll be working together in your team uh, to 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 write this, to write all those different parts, to create those different parts. So next week, go down to the schedule. So remember, everything's like pushed back a week, right? So because we took that extra week to get caught up on the previous uh, project um, before last. So this stuff right here, is basically for week 10, uh, where we're going to circulate your instruction manual for feedback. And we got the weekly writing assignment, which is basically peer review. Now next week, which will be week 11, is where we got all this stuff coming up. And basically I'll be telling you how to turn in your instruction manual on Open Lab. And I'm going to introduce the collaboration projects. And I'll, all this will be the reading that I'll, that I'll point you toward next week. So don't, you don't have to worry about that right now, but just want to give everybody a heads up that that's where we're heading towards. 
And again, I don't want anybody to freak out about the timing because I know things are very compressed. I actually designed the syllabus so that this assignment was more compressed than the previous ones because like in the workplace, you're going to be working under pressure, under deadlines to get writing and other tasks done very quickly. Um, and we're you're simulating that uh, as much as we can in our class. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, if we were meeting in person, a lot of this class is done with studio time. Studio time is where you work independently or with your team uh, during class time. You know, we're meeting asynchronously, so we don't. There isn't such a thing, but that's why my lectures don't run a full three hours, is because I expect you to be using class time on your projects in addition to class, your time outside of our class on the projects. But I want to give you as much time to work on that as possible. So uh, I'll be sending around those emails on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, remember, my office hours are Wednesday afternoon from 3 until 5 p.m., and I'll post a link to that on our Open Lab site. Um, if anybody's got questions, you can always reach out to me at my email address, jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. Um, and if you need to meet with me outside of my office hours, let me know when you're available um, so we can set that up. Um, and I'll try to find a time in my schedule to make that happen. So I think that covers everything for what I wanted to talk about. Just refresh your memories about last week's lecture on the instruction manual. Remember on our Open Lab site, um, don't be afraid to scroll down, okay? This is. You know, this is relatively straightforward, reverse chronological order, the way things are posted here. Um, but I also am not trying to spoon feed you all because you are all adults. You're about to be in your professional careers. You are all technologists studying computer science or computer technology in one form or another. So you need to know how these things work. Uh, that we use in our class because you will likely encounter them in other aspects of your career. Um, so I'm not trying to spoon feed anybody here. Uh, you need to spend time studying what's presented on our open lab site, what's presented here in the video lectures, in order to follow what's going on and to do the work in the class. Um, it requires a lot of you know self-motivation, and avoiding procrastination on your part uh, to be successful at this. And I know you can do it, uh, but it does take some work. Uh, so if anybody's got questions, make sure you let me know. Um, I'll be sending around those peer review emails so you can get on that for this week's weekly writing assignment. Again, remember, it's just whatever you got, okay, um, that you send around because you you can still elicit more feedback from your team. You can elicit feedback from your friends and family. That's all fair game. Uh, but with this peer review, is like get what you can um, you know, from your team uh, as you begin revising and finalizing your instruction manual into a final draft to submit next week or very soon thereafter, hopefully. Okay? So you guys all hang in there. Remember to vote. Um, and good luck. Um, stay healthy, um, be safe out there.